Welcome to the Misophonia Podcast. This is episode 12 of season 4. My name is Adil Ahmad, and I have Misophonia. This week, I'm talking to Natalie. Natalie is in Austin, Texas, living alone, now working alone, at home like many of us. In this episode, we talk a lot about her childhood and family situation growing up. Natalie is really open about all the chaotic things that were going on around her, anxiety disorders that developed, untreated trauma, plus some thoughts she'd rather not have her sister or even her boyfriend here. Uh, I do want to mention a content warning for folks that there, there is some talk of uh, sexual assault in this episode. Also some foul language, but those aren't as big of a deal. Just before we get to that, remember to please leave a review or just a rating in your podcast player. It helps the algorithms show this podcast to more people. And also just a note, uh, because so many people have been asking, the next batch of interviews will be around September. So stay tuned later this summer for the calendar to open up. All right, now let's get to my conversation with Natalie. Welcome, Natalie, to the podcast. Good to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, um, yeah, why don't you tell us kind of like, you know, whereabouts, whereabouts you are? Yeah, I um, am from Austin, Texas, and that is where I'm based. I went to school in Chicago. I went to college in Chicago, and then I lived in Los Angeles for a little bit, and now I'm back home. And I'm a, I have a background in theater and film, but my day job is as a technical writer for a software company. That's just very cool. So, uh, so you're a technical writer at, uh, at a software company. Are you? Well, I'm assuming you're working at home now. Um, are you usually like in an office, like a classic open office kind of situation? I was definitely um, for let's see, about a year, and then right at my year, my year mark is April first, twenty nineteen. So I was there for a year, and then of course this time last year is when we all went home so yeah before that i was working in the office four days a week we got to work from home one day a week um but yeah it was that classic open office (laughs) set up with lots of people and their and their food (laughs) and it was a lot (laughs) but i do miss parts of it for sure your classic open office environment that we all know and you know you usually usually are okay with if we have headphones on. I'm, I'm assuming. Um, how, how did you how did you deal with that then? <laughs> oh yeah, headphones were a must. Um, but then of course uh, the visual cues right. start, so that was kind of hard. But um, it actually got got pretty difficult for a little bit in there. But I'm I'm lucky in that the so my company was at one office downtown, and then we moved out to an office out sort of in the boonies um, and the office was much bigger and there were more spaces to work. So at a certain point every day, I would just leave my desk and go to a booth and just kind of hunker down. Um, But I have loved working from home. It has been just the greatest um, because I don't have to deal with any, like I can completely control my I'm also very lucky. I only, I only live with my cat, so I don't mm-hmm. have to kids or even a dog would be a lot, I think, <laughs> to be inside with all day. But I can control my environment really well. So that has been a really great part of all of this, even if it's also been terrible <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah, right, right. No, I, I hope uh, some of these some of these flexi- um, flexible situations kind of carry forward. Have you gotten any whiff of any... Uh, policy potential policy changes going forward are you going to be able to maybe work from home more often or uh, make, mix it up yeah so they recently offered us three options they said you could choose you know classic office situation a mixed remote and office and then fully remote and so i plan on choosing fully remote and then if i ever want to go into the office for like a happy hour or uh, you know a big sort of presentation or meeting then i can uh, work it one of the aforementioned booths yeah Um, so that uh i think will be the best option for me personally and this is pretty much permanent i'm I'm assuming right yes indeed um our our productivity went up like people i were either more as productive or more productive um as they were before so the company definitely was like 
it would be silly to force everyone to go back in. It, basically, they're opening the office because people, some people want to go back. Right, right. Out of sort of necessity. And, and happy hours and, and things like that, obviously, you know, get that, get that, uh, the, you know, the company bonding and morale uh, yeah. going. So, uh, yeah, I mean, offices are basically just going to be uh, a giant lobbies basically in the future <laughs> yeah. where you can go in and, and um, you know, hang out if you want, and then you just actually get some real work at home. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> So uh okay, very cool. Um yeah, and, and and you you were saying uh you were saying something before COVID, you were saying something that uh has come up in the podcast podcast before is uh, open office environments, uh pure open office environments suck. But if um there seems to be a trend towards like kind of a mixed mixed space environment where uh I mean I've worked at some situations before where it's partly open office, partly breakout rooms, partly phone booths, like a total gamut of uh of environments, which I think is, um, which is great. Just a mixes things up, but you know, we can all escape to our, whatever environment we want. And, and what about, yeah. What about, a, a, you know, you, you live at home with your cat, like how, how you know, how is, um, um, you know, how, basically how's your living situation in, in general? Are you in an apartment? Are you, uh, kind of in a, a separate house? I'm in an apartment, just a classic, very small one bedroom apartment. I have an outdoor space, um, which has been really nice, but yeah. because I tend to get really sensitive to sound and to, um, I just get really sensitive about my environment. I have not really worked out there. I, I usually hang out there with friends. I've been doing like a, you know, social distance, um, drinks. Yeah. Um, when I'm more relaxed is when I can tend to it. And when I'm around other people, I can tend to ignore, um, my environmental sort of stressors more um but uh yeah so i just i work in my living room which is also kind of my kitchen and uh sometimes i'll work in my bedroom which is like three steps away from there so not a lot of environmental sort of mix up but because i'm alone i really don't mind it's it's been really wonderful to just be able to like shut everything off like I can put on a podcast as loud as I want while I'm working or I can work in total silence and I never have to worry about another you know person making noise around me or um yeah it's just been great my my neighbor I can hear my neighbor <laughs> because yeah. my walls are kind of thin um which can get a little bit frustrating um I I'm trying to to work on that but I um whenever I can hear him making noise i just go into my bedroom which is on the other right. side of the floor, and it ends up and i have a white noise maker and that really uh takes care of it which is great is that a, a white noise maker is, is one of those like uh, uh basically like a, a speaker which has a bunch of sounds preset no it's um it's a true white noise maker it's uh, it's by dome a company called dome mm -hmm. d-o-m um, and my mom is a therapist and she, uh, has always had one outside of her office. And so when I went off to college, I knew that I would need one. So I've had it for 10 years now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one blessed white noisemaker that has really just saved me. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's great. And so you use it, uh, you use it at home, like when you, when that neighbor is starting to make noise or is, is, uh, or to go to sleep? Like, what are some of the example uh, situations? Um, mostly to sleep, but mm -hmm. when I when my neighbor is making noise, I um, definitely I will definitely use it. Um, but that's honestly because my bedroom is further away from our shared wall. It it actually that usually takes care of it unless it's like it's being really loud. Which and really loud for me is a whole different scale. Like. A normal person living in my apartment would not even notice my neighbor making noise, but because I'm hypersensitive and hypervigilant and I hear, I have very good hearing because of that. Um, so yeah, usually I don't use the white noise maker then, but there have been occasions where I have. Um, and it's just honestly knowing that it's there is really helpful too. Yeah. So does that, yeah. A lot of the times our, our armor, what I call it is, is just good to have there. Even, even <laughs> earbuds, you don't necessarily have to whip them out of every situation, but just knowing them they're there can kind of calm you, calm you down. So you're, you're talking about environmental stressors earlier. Oh, what kind of, um, 
or are you talking about the sounds of nature or kind of urban sounds, construction sounds? Um, Both. Honestly, mm -hmm. it sounds kind of bad, but like nature sounds can really bother me sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm trying to work, I think it's when I'm when I'm trying to focus or do something that is like in my own. I know this, this is a strange, I don't know, way of putting this, but it sort of connects to my overall theory of what misophonia stems from. But when I'm sort of trying to assert my um, self in some way, which like when I'm working and focusing or, or even when I'm like journaling or working on some kind of like creative project, whenever I'm asserting my own sort of like self-interest, I start to get really frustrated with repetitive sounds in nature, um, like when I'm outside. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I'll have a neighbor who's like talking and the repetitive sound of the talking, like the cadence of their voice can start to really bother me. Um, and then also if the weather, like wind can sometimes, uh, like re repetitive wind, yeah. it starts to feel like, if I'm really trying to concentrate on something, it feels like I'm being attacked by mm -hmm. the, my, the sensory world. Um, but as soon as I'm just hanging out with friends, I'm really laid back and am not as sensitive to those things. Um, it's really when I'm trying to assert my own like self-interest in a task or um, yeah, just anything I'm trying to concentrate on. Suddenly it feels like I'm being like <laughs> attacked by the world. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of us under, understand what you're yeah. talking about there. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, nature sounds, yeah, nature sounds can help, but yeah, they, I think people understand that they can, you can, your, your mind can just hook on to it when you really, what you really want to do is focus on the task at hand or your thoughts or whatever you're, whatever you're working on. Um, and that's when you go back inside, <laughs> I guess, and uh, sh shut yourself up in your room. Um, <laughs> Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, maybe let's before we get too um, too too far in kind of the, in kind of the present. Maybe let's go back to kind of early days for you and when you started to notice all this starting. Yeah, um, I was actually that was the one thing I did think about before coming on tonight. Um, one thing I sort of prepared. You're not supposed to think about anything before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, well, because I just had dinner with my parents tonight, and okay. My my parents are my number one trigger, so I was like very uh, aware um, of of that. We're all fully vaccinated and everything, so it was just d disclaimer. It was a safe uh, dinner um, Good. in their house, but um, I was thinking about that and when it started. And um, so I experienced a sexual assault when I was five years old, and I um, that has been you know I actually don't really have trouble talking about it like it's very much uh something i talk about a lot and i'm trying to be sort of in the advocacy world um so uh i was thinking about that and i when i first started notice when my parents started noticing that i was like when it started to become a problem the the chewing is is really the first thing that started that was the problem um i i think i was about seven but i'm but I'm pretty sure I was starting to be bothered like right after the assault. So the trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which I hadn't honestly in all my, I've been in therapy for over 10 years now. I hadn't really drawn the straight line between those two things because my childhood environment was all like apart from the assault, which happened outside of my home. Um, my, my home environment as a kid was pretty chaotic um anyway so i i always assumed it was sort of something to do with that but thinking about it tonight i was like oh wow yeah like that was around the same time and then it just was untreated and and my anxiety got so bad and um i think it was a snowball effect that by the time i was seven eight nine ten years old it was just getting worse and worse but no one knew what was going on even though my mom my mom is, was actually a child psychologist she's now just a regular adult psychologist um now that i've grown out of being a kid um she decided to move on to to that but um even she did not know what was going on um which was really 
looking back kind of um incredible that yeah that she didn't know and that no she one didn't really know about the involved. she didn't know about the assault or oh, about no, no, the, like, okay no right. everyone fully yeah fully, that was okay. fully fully talked about um but the uh the anxiety manifesting as hatred mm. of sound um it just goes to show that it was just such an unknown like thing even to you know a phd like child psychologist um but i was actually diagnosed with ocd um around ooh now i can't remember i think i was like eight or nine so i think i mean i think it's all very connected to to it um the ocd manifested as like hyper um hyper vigilance around my um like my room being clean and my homework being done like i from the outside it was like wow what an amazing kid but like right. <laughs> was it really about uh the cl- it wasn't about making good grades it was about maintaining like a sense of control um mm-hmm. i mean i also like enjoyed the fact that i was getting a lot of external validation for a lot of that stuff but um so yeah i think i think um yeah it early childhood like the once the ocd and the anxiety started to manifest is when yeah the misophonia um got worse and worse and it was so funny like looking back my family just it was like oh natalie's that like she's being bothered by that thing again like she can't eat she can't eat tonight at the dinner table with y'all or um you know she's gonna my dad would even sort of like go as far as sort of like semi making fun of me about it um because he just did not he just did not get it um now they they respect it more i sent them some articles and um some things about it and i was like see i told you i'm not crazy like (laughs) it was a whole thing um did they did people blame it on they they kind of uh married to the OCD or other anxieties or maybe think of it as a symptom of those of those or was it just um just a weird thing it was just a weird thing Mm. like I honestly I think they attributed it more to my really amazing sense of hearing more than anything they're like oh Mm. hear like through walls and I could hear through walls I could I knew exactly the moment that my parents started eating like every time i could be in my room and i could like i knew all the cues with the fork hitting the the bowl or the plate and i like the way their voices changed like i knew i could hear it um and so i think they thought like it had more to do with that than anxiety which is bizarre because i was also experiencing like hardcore (laughs) Like anxiety around what age was this again this was around um, uh, the late so, elementary yeah yeah like yeah. like seven eight nine ten okay yeah um but i'm sure that i was starting to be bothered around you know right right Five and yeah yeah, yeah six, probably gotcha and and so it was your parent did you have any siblings by the way I do. I have a, an older sister and an older brother. Um, they're my sister's ten years older than me. And my brother is six years older than me. So okay. The- gotcha. And so, uh, so you're, you're eating eating sounds. You're in your parents were were your first and main triggers. How I'm I'm hearing. Yes, um, my parents were the first, and then um, I have a best friend, uh, like. My basically my other sister who I grew up with who started to bother me a lot around the two. Um and uh and off and on, yeah. So yeah, so th- those are sort of my first my first triggers that I remember. And so how were you uh and how were some of your kind of reactions um to were you starting to act out with your parents? Like was it kind of a uh, antagonist like um adversarial or was it just kind of a, a leaving escaping um and then being made fun of once in a while <laughs> um kind of somewhere in the middle of that i would okay. definitely leave and escape i would um i would I, gosh i'm really like looking back it's so crazy like thinking i was so young when i started doing all this stuff yeah um, take your time yeah yeah i would like i would definitely leave so basically if i was done eating 
I had to leave the table. If I was, if they were, if it was just me sitting there while they were eating, that was like it's an horrible, over- yeah. overwhelming, impossible thing for me. I could not handle it. Um, sometimes they would start eating like not at mealtime. Like it'd be a random sort of like we'd be in the kitchen. My mom would just like start eating something while she was cooking. And I would like have a physical, this came a little later. I'm really struggling to remember what I did like right when I was like six, seven, eight years old. Um, But I definitely had a physical, like, um, I can't even describe it. Like I would sort of clench my whole body um, and kind of grind my teeth. And, and I think as I started to realize how bad it was, I would also tell my, I would do like a thing with my parents where I'd be like, please stop eating, please stop eating. Like I would just say that. Mm. And then my parents would sort of acknowledge what was happening. And then that made me feel a little bit better. Like they're acknowledging me, made me feel better. Um, but yeah, it was it was definitely somewhere in the middle. Like I, I didn't, we didn't, they weren't in full, denial like screaming forcing me to be at the table kind of thing but they also were not like trying to read up on it and you know right kind of, um accommodate me majorly so it was kind of kind of like everything in my childhood it was sort of like halfway <laughs> yeah well i think that's what a lot of us yeah <laughs> uh, yeah it doesn't really make sense to most people still it doesn't and so it's just kind of like yeah and then, and then we're not, I mean, we're just dealing with our triggers. It's not like we're in this in a position of like trying to educate people or even uh, try to understand what's going on in the middle of a trigger. How about your uh, siblings? Did they start to trigger you at some point? I know your best friend did, but. Uh... Yes. Um, so, so this sort of flows into, if it's okay, I might sort of get into my. Um, Go wherever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where I think this comes from. So, um, so, oh goodness. I, I don't, I hope, I don't know. I don't think I'll send this to my sister. I don't know, but it's something she doesn't know, which is that she bothers me, my brother doesn't. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think it's because our relationship, um, and she doesn't bother me all the time. So that's the thing, like my parents and my best friend bothered me a lot uh, right off the bat because they had control over my life. So they were were people who asserted dominance over Mm -hmm. me and we're not um, like fully sort of, I am trying to articulate this in a, in a good way, like focused on my needs or I felt like I had to change my needs or my, um, yeah, I, I felt like I had to change myself in order to accommodate them. Yeah. And so when they did something that was out of my control, which chewing is like, one of the main, I mean, sound like the sound someone makes is so outside of your control. Um, it that's what I instead of being angry with them for like not, you know, uh, focusing on my needs or accommodating my needs, I would just get angry at them for chewing. And so throughout my life, I've noticed that although my parents and that friend, um, but you know, definitely more my parents were the primary sort of like, I directed most of this anger at, I've noticed that when people start, when I start to feel like I am changing myself majorly, like majorly, you know, pushing my needs down in order to accommodate theirs. And it's not just my choice. It's like their personality is such that we can't really exist in the same space unless I shift is when I really, which like I notice it almost immediately their, their chewing starts to bother me. And it's funny. I'll go, I'll go in and out of phases with people. It's like my sister, sometimes she doesn't bother me. Um, if we're sort of like in a good space, we don't even have that much, like barely any conflict in our relationship, but, She's 10 years older than me and she's a very strong personality. And so I, throughout my life, sort of felt like I um, needed to change myself in order to accommodate that. Um, But when I'm feeling strong, it doesn't bother me. And my brother and I don't have that relationship at all. We're both, we're very similarly 
laid back and accommodating of others. So his chewing could just, could never bother me because I've never felt like I've had to um, mm. put away my need. And he's very attentive to my needs in a way that um, my sister and my parents aren't. But it's very subtle. And I like, if my sister ever listens to this, I want her to know that it's not, it's not like anything she did wrong. It is, it's just like a dynamic, a power dynamic thing that I can't fully, it like, I don't know. It's not, um, it's not like a one-to-one -one of like, these are the people I have a bad relationship with. I hate their chewing. It's, it's really more complicated than that. But, yeah, um, no, it's complicated. And it's, it's definitely not that somebody is doing something on purpose unless they're being out you know outrageously disgusting on an objective level but uh but yeah you're right there's there's yeah something else going on here and you're you're, you're hitting upon some interesting things because those uh people who basically who affect the who can affect the environment you're in um in a way that's slightly out of your control that could be parents um growing when you're growing up pa parents uh, uh partners um coworkers. <laughs> uh, you know, bosses. Uh, these are tend to be a lot of the a lot of the main triggers. And I noticed uh, uh, in a lot of cases, though, um, people's childrens are not necessarily a trigger, which is interesting. And maybe that's kind of a reverse situation where they seem, you know, your brain um, considers them not a threat and not. You know, obviously, no, they're not necessarily going to like really. Um, you have more control over them, their environment, than they have over you. So maybe that's you know just trying to riff off of your your theory um maybe that's another extension of that but that, yeah it's really interesting uh did you come up with that kind of on your own were you talking with your maybe your mom who's a psychologist um i did kind of i i came to this conclusion honestly when i i met someone in college who was also a youngest child who had been through a traumatic divorce so we sort of bonded about that first and then we both we were kind of just I don't even know how it came up, but we both realized that we have this thing with noise. And I was like, oh my God, it ha it's, it's control. It's oh. environmental control. It's about people who like, it's about having, it's about not having your needs met when you're a kid and then feeling like you have to put your needs away in order to accommodate the environment that you're in. And in order to maintain like some kind of like peace or yeah, I don't know, but it, the youngest, the, the young, I would love to actually see a study of like what birth order, how birth order affects it because um, my friend and I just like really connected it to being the youngest kid and to feeling like not having any control over anyone else in the family, like just feeling like the, the person who was being affected the most by the chaos and the trauma that was going on in the family. Not that older children, not that oldest children don't feel it, you know, obviously it is like completely, you know, falls on kids differently. Um, no, but that'd be interesting. I might go back in for pre past episodes and find out and try to listen for, uh, you know, who, who was the young sibling and <laughs> see if there's any kind of pattern there. Cause, uh, yeah, that, that's great. That is quite interesting. Um, and and it, that that friend or that person that you met with, so they had a thing with noise. Was it? It turned out to be misophonia, like full blown misophonia. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We still talk about it actually. Um, her thing was more um, fidgeting and clicking pens, um, mm. and mine was more um, eating. Although eating bothered her too. Um, and unfortunately, now mine has grown it's like a different trigger for different people now. Like yeah. chewing really bothers me. My partner, God bless him. I feel so bad. He doesn't even know this yet because <laughs> I can't, I just can't admit it yet fully, but man, his, his chewing doesn't really bother me. His after chewing is bothering me now. I don't understand why like that after, after chewing sort of cleaning sounds that people okay yes yes no i i yeah i have issues with that and the the visual the visual side of that as well is uh yeah. oh yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah. His... let's leave that one there but yeah i yeah <laughs> oh my gosh but his fidgeting bothers me like he knows that it kind of bothers me haha ha, like to stop doing that but it's really starting to bother me out so much so that it's like i'm i 
have like flashes of like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> because mm-hmm. I'm like, how am I supposed to live with someone for the rest of my life who needs to do that to pens? <laughs> they have one in their hand. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, um, it comes down to, it comes down to just, yeah, I mean, if people just end up uh, just trying to control the environment, just knowing when certain patterns are going to happen and, and just get, you know, look away or move away or, you know, move to another. Yeah turn your attention away so um yeah. you tend to tr- you tend to find ways around it as, as much as you as much as you can so yeah. um being open being open with people about it actually helps a lot like when he starts to fidget i'm i've learned that it's okay for me to say hey can you stop doing that and that actually the knowing that it's safe for me to do that is kind of half the battle um because i think i think that's part of it too it's like I feel like they are what what bothers me like and what I said earlier about my parents like as soon as they acknowledged what was happening it would make me feel better. I think really what I'm getting at when it comes down to is that I feel like as a a youngest kid as a kid who grew up in a chaotic environment that I was constantly trying to control with like various methods of you know kind of obsessive compulsive cleaning and um, obsessing about, uh, you know, homework and tasks and, um, even obsessing about things I had said and done, I would just sort of like go over them over and over and ruminate. Um, all of that stuff, I felt like I was paying really close attention to everyone else. Like I, I noticed mood changes. I noticed like, oh my gosh, I knew, I know everyone's birthday. Like I, if someone tells me their birthday, I will remember. It's like I have like a synesthesia. July seventeenth, nineteen seventy six. I'll ask oh you at God. the end of the podcast. I will. I will absolutely remember that. I I truly don't forget birthdays. Um, it's it. It's I've sort of tied that to like maybe some synesthesia thing with colors and numbers too. But oh, yeah. I pay very close attention to everyone else, and I think as a kid, I did not feel like people were paying. It's like I'm giving more than I'm getting in terms of paying attention to those little things, not just the like, you know, big things, but like the little things that like a little sibling, like I remember my, you know, all my brother's girlfriends and their birthdays and their names and like details about them and my sister and all of her, like, you know, every celebrity crush she had when she was a kid. I remember all of that because they were my world, but they don't remember you know, they don't know my friends' names, all of them. They don't remember their birthdays. They don't remember, like, because that, you know, they had other, it's totally understandable. Like, it's very natural for an older sibling to not be obsessed with their younger sibling. Like, right. very natural for the other way around. But I think when I sense someone doing something unconscious, when they're not thinking about me and my needs, it manifests um, in their, like, clicking and eating and um stuff i can't control so um it's sort of like it's almost a prompt for me to like re-examine what's going on in the relationship but it's also like damn if you marry someone that's good that's a long time to have to constantly <laughs> right right well hopefully there are many other uh, advantages that uh start to out- outweigh that um but yeah it's definitely something to think about <laughs> yeah um <laughs> What, what about um, what about like other friends as you were growing up? I, 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 you know, we know about your your best friend, who's still your best friend, is a ma- major trigger. Did it start to affect like uh, uh, who you were hanging out with, how long, how often you were hanging out with people? Um, did it start to affect your, that social life outside of the home, outside of the home? Um, honestly, not. It it was so. It's one of those things like this has been such an odd thing in my life because when it's not happening, I truly forget that I have it. Like when I'm not mm-hmm. experiencing it, my brain just says, nope, we're just going to put that away. And then as soon as it's happening, I'm fully focused and it's like overwhelming, yeah. and really scary. Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even tell my therapist, like my first therapist, she didn't even know about it. I like looked back and I was like, I never told her about that because I saw her in Chicago when I was in college. And I was never around my parents. And so I just, it just didn't come up because it just didn't come up. Cause like, I just wasn't being like, when it was happening, it was overwhelming. And when it wasn't, it was like out of sight, out of mind, out of sound, out of mind. Um, oh, excellent. Yes. <laughs> but it didn't, yeah, it didn't actually, 
it didn't really affect yeah so so i would forget and then i would be in a situation and then i would be like oh shit like i hate it when you do that oh it's back yeah Not here yeah exactly <laughs> but no it didn't it didn't affect my um my social life so much um like the larger patterns of my social life i was a very social mm -hmm. uh teenager and kid teenager adult i'm very social um and it doesn't really affect yeah it doesn't really affect me there but it it ends up i'll be all of a sudden i'll be in a situation and it'll be like oh damn i need to work on this <laughs> yeah because i mean yeah yeah i mean socially with your with friends it's like they could be your best friend but you don't it's not like as especially as an adult you don't it's not like you see them that often and right. for more than like a couple hours so you know your brain knows like this is going to be over you can chill out for for a little while i think subconsciously um and you know going back maybe going back to your theory like you you know you ultimately have control of the environment and whatever the environment is it's going to be it's going to dissipate with you know when that friend leaves so that might help um might be the reason why a lot of us can be social butterflies mm -hmm. exactly and and that's why i don't have roommates anymore um because i noticed oh god no yeah <laughs> yeah i i know i god, i can't believe i ever thought i could um i mean my my last roommate that i had um we both actually had a sound thing um she did not call it full-on misophonia i was like i have misophonia and she was like i think i have something like that um so that actually helped. We were both very, because I knew that she got it in some ways, mm -hmm. it actually was okay. Um, and then, and then just for, you know, various early twenties reasons, we just did not work out. Um, and, um, and I noticed that her sound, like as our roommate relationship was sort of winding down and I would not say deteriorating, but that's kind of, we've all been through that yeah up in the <laughs> early, early 20s -ness. yes yeah <laughs> like oh god your needs and my needs are so different yeah. and i can't bridge that gap it's like a second puberty or something i feel oh. like it's like yeah that is such a good way of putting it absolutely yeah and it's like but then you have to factor in like money <laughs> <laughs> right which is just the worst um but i noticed that as it was winding down her sounds were bothering me um when I when it was reaching the point where I didn't know whether I was going to sign a, sign the lease or not, and mm. uh, her, her sounds were really bothering me then. So, it's a uh, yeah, like I said, it's sort of a prompt for me to know that something's up in this relationship. Maybe I should, or 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 something's up in the environment in which this relationship is existing. Right. So I guess continuing on then. Uh, so yeah, you're you're now you know independent young woman early to mid 20 ish is uh, 20 is uh, whatever around that age um and, and so what's going on then you're starting to get jobs um or um maybe i, I don't know what you were doing around that time but uh how, how did things change then maybe yeah you are starting to get your first jobs um work environments going into the workforce did, was that another um was that an easy transition or you know hard slap in the face kind of or how did that go so this job that I have now is my first big girl corporate job. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was in um, film and theater. And so I was working in the service industry, which I'd been doing since I graduated from college. So um, I did that. Was your uh, college degree in, in film and theater? Yeah, it was in theater. Okay, yep. gotcha. Um, so I was an actor and a playwright, screenwriter, and I'm still... Uh, writing um, and I'm I act sometimes but it's not my focus anymore so mm -hmm. um, but yes my work environments were <laughs> very strange it was like a bar or a restaurant or you know I'd be doing some random freelance editing work on my computer um, and I nannied for a while which was actually pretty chill um, but um, the I so I, I actually did not experience a lot of symptoms while I was working in restaurants and, and bars because the environment is so fast paced that you don't really get time to focus on anything there. I can remember some customers. Yeah. were just hanging out for a long time <laughs> sitting at the end of the bar and I would just be like, Oh my God, 
you stop yeah chewing <laughs> right um, but, but it, was, it just tends to be a, a lot of white noise maybe some clangs here and there but mm -hmm. uh, uh but i would imagine there are probably worse situations absolutely yeah a lot of white noise for sure like just chatter um and then really i didn't get i i did not get the full um kind of slap in the face until i went back to um until i until, not back to until i started yeah. working for uh the company i work for now and i um sat in that open office sort of environment and i was like oh this is like school this is like high school again with someone sniffling behind me and like someone's eating a bag of chips and you know someone's over there like constantly blowing their nose and like the 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 motion of their hand to their nose over and over again is driving me crazy or or the woman who i can't hear her chewing but i can see her chewing yep. and something about the way that she is bothers me and so it's like with strangers it's like this terrible thing where i just like attach a vibe to them and then i'm like i hate you and everything you do it's like this poor woman who is so lovely and nice, but like from far away, I was like, there's something about you that bothers me. And you, she just chewed really loud. And I was like, someone who chews loudly is someone I hate, even if I know her to be a nice person. Um, but that's yeah, it's funny. It's yeah. you're right. You, we attach this character to this person. And uh, it's probably even more interesting as, as a playwright and an actor for you to just yeah. kind of like <laughs> create all these characters out of, in your head of all these people based on, uh, uh, you know, them having a cold one day or something. Exactly, exactly. I can imagine a whole attitude about, it's like I imagine, you know, their whole attitude about the world and about life. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know how they vote and everything. Vote, and yeah. yeah, which, yeah, that can really be part of it. Um, but like it, that kind of stuff comes up when I'm in an airport, an airplane, when I was in an office, like places where I felt trapped, um, where I couldn't get out is when strangers start to bother me because strangers don't usually um i mean it depends it's so contextual and weird. It, like, yeah happens, and then sometimes it's like i'm to like i'm in my part i mean i guess i'm trapped in my apartment so that's why my neighbor bothers me but like yeah it's so weird sometimes strangers don't bother me but when but i know that when i am trapped in an airport, airplane, uh, public transit, or like the office environment, I um, I certainly can count on getting symptoms. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think we I think we all do. Um, when when did um, when did you then when did you realize that misophonia was? You said it was just recently. When when did you realize that it that it had its own name and it was you know being talked about and there was a community? So I actually. Um, I think I, I misremembered. I re I learned the name in college. I somewhat, mm -hmm. it was after talking to that, that friend who I think she named it for me. And then I Wikipedia it and read about it and just had like a jaw dropping, like, Oh my God, yeah. like, holy shit. There are other people who are like me. Um, but again, it would, it would come in and out of my consciousness because then I would just like forget about it for a while because out of sound out of mind and then all of a sudden i'd be like oh yeah i have to like deal with that thing that i have that's horrible that totally affects my life um but it wasn't until i think a year ago or two years ago on twitter which i'm not on anymore because it's a toxic terrible place for me but there was one bright spot and it was finding um uh we're, I can't. Is this you here? Our misophonia? Is that you? Is that your Twitter handle? Uh, no, I'm misophonia show. Oh, okay. Then I think. Oh, I here our misophonia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I know who. Um, she. Yeah. She, uh, he or she always. Uh, I think it's a she. Uh, I'll always. Um, she's very active and and, and I know retweets a bunch of uh, a bunch of mis misophonia podcast stuff. So, yeah, yeah, she's quite active. Okay. Then that. Then that's how I heard about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had been following her for a couple of, like, I guess a year or so, um, and started, people would, um, you know, retweet or reply to her tweets and mm -hmm. say, oh my God, like, I think I have this, like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And then I started replying and being like, hi, like, 
you're not alone. Like here's some of my, the ways that I cope. And, um, and now I'm on a, in a Facebook group uh, called adult sensory processing disorder uh, Facebook group. And people talk about it a lot in there and I'll, I'll jump in sometimes and give some, some moral support tips and tricks. Yeah. Is that, that's, is that a more general, uh, that's, that's all sensory processing. Yeah. Uh, so not, not just misophonia. Yeah. I feel like I, I could probably join. I'm sure there are other Facebook groups for specifically misophonia. Oh but, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But I, um, but for some reason I just, I, I can't remember what prompted me to join this one. I think, I think I was just thinking about like, what the larger I all I, like basically all my friends are sensitive artists or just sensitive in one way or another. So mm-hmm. I think it was coming off the heels of conversation that I had with them about sensory like overwhelm. And then I found that group and then, but then I discovered that there were a lot of people who had my sort of version of <laughs> a sensory processing disorder. So um, right. yeah, I think, yeah, like a couple of years I've been more active in the community online that's great cool. more the more the merrier yeah. and uh and when you when uh, when you found out that it had a, had a name uh, so had how, how far along had your kind of had you reached your your own conclusion on uh on kind of the roots of this like had that had you already been thinking about this a lot uh before you found out that misophonia was its own word or how did that kind of affect your um kind of your theories um i'm trying to figure i'm trying to remember i think it was like 2012 I think I remember where I was living when I was reading this article. And at that point, I thought that it had to do with um, w- my weight, like eating and and mm-hmm. like being under pressure to be thin for uh, film, which was another big um, sort of piece in my childhood that was uh, very difficult was that um, I'm not naturally thin. And so I had to always be concerned about that. And it's just like really hard. And I always thought that the chewing thing was me hating my parents for like being hard on me about that. Um, so I think I had that theory. And then I read that Wikipedia page and I'm pretty sure something clicked about anxiety after reading that. Like, I think the words anxiety disorder were somewhere on that page. And then I started thinking about like, oh, oh, okay. Cause I was in therapy for the first time and sort of starting to understand more about what anxiety sort of meant and how it wasn't just you're worried about the future um, or you're nervous all the time, but your um, anxiety is really about feeling uh, out of control. And it's like fear of annihilation, essentially, like fe- fear that whatever is going to happen will destroy you. Um, and um, I, so all of those things were coming together for me at that point. So, yeah, it wasn't really until after after that point, I guess, that it um, it started to make more sense. Um, yeah, gotcha. the, the, kind of the trauma and all of that stuff, all that. Gotcha. Together. Okay. Okay. So after that, it start, yeah, you started to put, put the pieces together. Um, and, and just to rewind real quick, because I was going to ask you, uh, just you had mentioned that, that life was kind of chaotic for you when you were young. Um, uh, I'm just curious, well, what what kind of things were ma- were making it ca- chaotic? Um, and, and then you just mentioned uh, this thing, the thing about weight. Where was there, you know, what, what was were there um, pressure you were getting from your parents and the and the outside world about uh, on other matters, not that were also kind of, you know af- post that assault. Um, that were kind of causing anxiety that you, that you can point to? Yeah. Um, I, when I was young, my family really struggled with money. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that anxiety was always sort of in the air, that feeling of like um, things not stretching far enough and uh, scarcity and all of that. Um, we also moved, we moved when I was about three, we moved to a new, this new house. Um, and the, so when I was like two to three, we lived in this rental house and um, I actually do have memories of it, of like, I didn't have a room. My room was in the middle of the living room. I slept in a, like a crib in the middle of the living room. And mm-hmm. my sister and my dad were very much at odds at that point. And so I went from like, 
and I was also, I'm, sorry, I'm like, keep going back in time. Um, to set the stage, my parents were in their 40s when I was born. I was, they love to say I was uh, not a surprise, but a welcome, or no, not an accident, but a welcome surprise. Um, yeah. But I think I definitely intruded on like a, a family that was very much could have been financially stable. And then um, my dad lost his job and I was born and, or I was born and then my dad lost his job. And so things just got, yeah, like we were living all together in this little rental house and then we moved to this other house and, um, but we were kind of house poor, like couldn't, we could afford the house somehow, but not like, you know, I don't even know. Just you know, a lot of the other people. stuff that you just, stuff people, that, yeah, yeah. You know, like new clothes and all that stuff. Right. And my parents were just fighting a lot and my dad and my sister were really fighting a lot. Um, and it just never felt like there was, mm, okay. it was, it was really like we had all the ingredients for peace, but we just couldn't ever all put it together. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, my dad was always doing business ventures. And, and meanwhile, I was like starting to do like theater and, uh, all these extracurricular activities that they could not afford to put me in, but somehow mm. did. And so I always felt like I was asking too much and, um, but I felt like I couldn't quit anything. Uh, and then, you know, there was always this narrative that was like early two thousands when like, you know, women are still incredibly thin in film, but, um, they particularly then it was like coming off of heroin chic kind of thing of the nineties. Yeah. Right. I was trying to think, uh, right. Heroin chic was nineties and yeah, I guess the low rise jeans movement. Uh, oh, Really, right. did not, really did not do it for the uh, <laughs> those of us with <laughs> with bits and butts, you know. Um, and I'm grateful that that's more of a thing now. Uh, but when I was growing, it was just I, there was just no way I was ever gonna look like that. But I somehow thought I had to in order to become an actress, in order to make a lot of money, in order to kind of help my parents, and like it got really tied into a lot of stuff that it didn't need to be. Okay, now that helps paint the picture kind of in broad strokes okay i i guess I, i'm curious now going back to we're actually all i think we're probably heading t towards the top of the hour but i do want to talk about maybe um maybe your, your dinner today with your with your parents did you mention that um that you're going to be on the show and kind of what you might <laughs> talk about um i'm curious what what how they are now what they what they think of your misophonia and uh um you know how they accommodate and and uh if they had any insights to, to share with you? Um, I actually, yeah, we, my parents and I, for all of our like issues and everything are, my family's really open about talking about this. We all have a mental health problem, like mental health issues. There's not a single person in my entire extended family on either side that has not struggled. Um, and my mom is a, you know, a mental health care provider. My brother is in school to be a mental health care provider. So, we, we love to talk about it. It's not, um, it's not a hidden thing really. Um, but, uh, it's, but, but we love to talk about it, but in terms of like actually taking it serious, taking other people's issues seriously and accommodating them, that's, that's the piece that, um, we've been working on and they've, they've gotten a lot better at it. My mom especially is, um, you know, she never remembers, like I have to always prompt her, like it's been, 20 years mm. and I still every single time I have to be like can you not you know can you not do that and like just Sunday night my dad was picking his nails and I was like dad please stop picking your nails and he like put his I don't know it's like I I hear the sound even when he's not making the sound yeah. because his hands go back together and then suddenly I think I can hear it and we got into a little bit of a conflict about that because he was like, I'm not doing anything. And I was like, yes, you are. Um, so they're, so like, it's, it's, they're like halfway there. They're a little, but they're definitely further than they were when I was a kid. Um, they don't really have insight except, you know, that they're, I think that they're glad that I've d found a community and that I've discovered mm -hmm. what's going on, but they're not, um, they're not going to like sit down with me and ask like, okay, like, so how can we support you in this? And, and you know, what's really going on? And 
you know, we're so sorry that we didn't get it when you were younger. Um, it's so interesting when you, when, um, when your family's surrounded by mental health issues and you have folks be, um, whose careers are mental health, that, uh, it's, it, that, that piece is missing. The kind yeah. of actually paying attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's very typical, like, um, intellectualizing it. And like, we love to have sort of theoretical conversations about mental health and spirituality and philosophy and like all of these sort of lofty things. But when it comes to like the hard work of really emotionally sort of being there, um, you know, that's when it gets tricky because, you know, we're just people and people struggle with that kind of thing. Um, I think it's pretty extraordinary when, I mean, I guess I think it's extraordinary. I hope it's not actually um, when parents can really sit down and like, you know, humble themselves in front of the this, the issue that their kid is having and like, um, not just like try to put it away or, you know, say, oh, I'm so, I was such a bad parent and, you know, I'm so sorry. And then try to make themselves a victim. Like to really just sit there in like full strength and say like, I'm so sorry. Like, what can I do? I find that, um, my family, we've had glimpses of that, but have not been able to do that in a, in a full throated way. Um, but that being said, like I said before, they're definitely better than they were. Um, and when I do say like, please, you know, stop doing something. They, my mom, like I said, my mom especially gets it and immediately like stops and apologizes. Well, that's great. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a step forward and hopefully that'll, that'll just get, uh, that'll spread. Well, I, I, you know, I want to give, we should maybe start to wind it down, but I, I do want to give you, uh, uh, a chance to kind of, uh, if you have anything else you want to, you want to say to, to the audience, uh, I know you're, you're trying to help out the, com- the community. Um, yeah. Do you want to, do you want to share anything else for folks who are, who are, who are struggling? Oh man. Um, I just really wish, I, I guess I'm just wanted to say, I'm so grateful that to you for creating this and for everyone in the community who has a platform who's speaking about this, because it's, it's so, I, I, it's truly just so profound to know that this thing that I've been struggling with for so long is not number one something I made up and also um yeah not something I'm alone with and it's just incredible absolutely not yeah I guess what I would say to anyone who's like just just starting out in their journey of realizing they're not uh making it up is that you're not making it up (laughs) and (laughs) and find one yeah yeah find other people and also the only thing that's ever worked for me besides noise canceling headphones and like I, I, I masks, um, on airplanes and, you know, you know, arm yourself with all the things that will help you block out sound sites, all of it. But I think to remember that at least for me, the root of this has been a lack of, um, self-compassion and a lack and, and really pushing my needs away and not, and allowing others to dictate how, I present my needs and I think meeting your own needs is a huge step towards not feeling so anxious and controlled by others. And this, this disorder definitely, um, I really can't speak for anyone else, but for me, it's very much tied to that. So be, be your own, be your best friend, treat yourself, Mm -hmm. treat yourself like you would treat your, your, your friend who's come to you and asked um, for help, you know, yeah, uh, take care of yourself. Be 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 assertive. Don't be ashamed to to take a step to wear that eye mask. Whatever you need to do. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Natalie, for coming on. This is this has been great. Yeah. Thank you so much again. This is just like really awesome. Thank you, Natalie. That was really one of my favorite conversations so far. If you liked this episode too, please leave a quick review or just hit the five stars wherever you listen to this podcast. Find us on social media at Misophonia Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, now on TikTok, or Misophonia Show on Twitter. Remember, you can also see transcripts um, in the, on our YouTube channel, and you can find those, uh, the link to that in the show notes as well. And in fact, all the links are also on the website, misophoniapodcast.com, 
and you can contact me from there. Music is always by Moby, and until next week, wishing you peace and quiet. Thank you.